All right. Thank you for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to this nice meeting. And I'm really sorry that I can't join you in Paris, but with the postponement of the course for one year, for obvious reasons, um, it ended up in a super busy period and I couldn't fit the trip to Paris into my schedule, unfortunately. But I hope you still um, will like my talk. And I also hope that we'll have the opportunity to interact in person um, soon. Right, so today I want to tell you a little bit about our research, how we use synthetic gene regulatory networks um, to build networks that can form spatial temporal patterns. Okay. Imagine a future where engineered bacteria destroy toxins, produce bioplastics, kill cancer cells, and constitute materials that repair themselves. Well, Welcome to the world of synthetic biology. I'm pretty hopeful that most of you came across the fascinating field of synthetic biology, where we combine the tools of molecular biology with engineering principles, such as the design, build, and test cycle, but also principles such as modularity and standardization to get biological systems with novel properties. And those novel systems have a lot of potential applica applications, some of which I just mentioned before. Indeed, a recent report of the McKinsey Global Institute predicts that this engineering of biology has the potential to profoundly change many aspects of our lives and also transform our economies. We can see here some of their estimates for the next 10 to 20 years. In addition to a lot of potential applications, synthetic biology also provides a powerful bottom-up approach to the general principles of mechanisms of the biological systems by building simplified versions that are easy to study. The sentence, what I cannot create, I do not understand, found on the blackboard of, at the time of death of Richard Feynman, nicely captures this approach. So this figure illustrates this approach for studying gene regulatory networks. It shows the interplay between natural circuits, synthetic circuits, and also mathematical modeling. Studying natural circuits is often very challenging. They're very complex. Uh, many of the genes have multiple functions, so they're pleiotropic. And there are a lot of confounding factors. Um, often we don't know their genetic background. And the networks might also be difficult to this perturb and some of the genes might have essential functions. With the tools of synthetic biology, we can rebuild parts of those networks and then test them and study them and test different hypotheses. As you're going to see later, this rebuilding is usually not done with ex exactly the same genes as um, are part of the natural network. Therefore, the kind of things we are going to learn here are not the specifics like um, protein A has a binding cost constant of so on and so, but it's more learning the fundamental properties of a network, the underlying mechanisms. For example, what is necessary um, for, a for a network that it can perform a specific function, such as producing oscillations or forming a pattern. It's this kind of bottom-up approach that we are doing in my group. So we take bulk characterized biological parts, such as open reading frames and promoters, and assemble them on a plasmid and express in a suitable host organism. So far, we have been mainly working in E. coli bacteria, but we started to use also other bacterial species. We then end up with a synthetic gene regulatory network that might share its topology and properties with a natural counterpart that is much easier to manipulate and to study. And we do so this with a focus on networks that can produce spatial or temporal patterns in a population of E. coli cells. We also use those networks to address questions of molecular evolution centered about robustness and evolvability. 
for today's talk, I will mainly focus on the patterning aspects and I'll also make a little bit a detour to the tools development that we had to do in so that we were able to build the kind of networks we are interested in. Right. Why are we interested in patterning? Well, patterns are omnipresent in biology. You can just see here a few examples. And so my group is interested in finding the simplest networks that can produce patterns and understanding their mechanism, their properties. And we also want to be able to engineer patterns of interest um, so that we then can use it for certain applications such as engineered living materials. One important concept in pattern formation is that of positional information. So we start with a tissue or a population of cells which are all identical, and then we have a locally produced signaling molecule that diffuses and forms a gradient. In developmental biology, we call this a morphogen. Specific gene regulatory networks are then capable of interpreting this information and producing a spatial pattern. In this case here, this green gene is only expressed at intermediate morphogen concentrations. So we are interested in what kind of gene regulatory networks can do this. And so back in my postdoc, we started with a computational approach where we built a model um, and focused on networks with just three nodes and asked the questions, what kind of networks with those three nodes can take the input of a morphogen concentration gradient and produce the output of what we call a single stripe of gene expression, meaning when we look here at this green gene, it's only highly expressed at intermediate concentrations, but it's off at low and high concentrations of the input. So we simulated all possible free node networks, each with um, 10,000 different parameter settings, and we kept all the networks that can produce such a straight. And we represented the results in a so-called genotype network, where here you can just see a subset, but each of these uh, vertex in this network um, represents a topology that can produce a stripe. And two of those are linked with an edge if they differ by a single interaction. So for example, the difference between this network and this network is the addition of this interaction. So we, this is only a subset. Indeed, we got over 100 networks that can do this job and they're shown here. Additionally, so again here, each vertex represents a topology that can form a stripe and we ordered them according complexity. So the most complex networks are at the top and the least ones are at the bottom. So what was striking to us is that we basically got four groups and at the bottom, the simplest networks corresponded to the so-called incoherent feed forward loops I1 to I4 and they had been described previously. And so they represent four different dynamical ways, four different mechanisms, how you can build up a strain. So we wanted to study this in more detail also now in the lab. So we came up with following setup. Our input was the sugar arabinose that was basically our morphogen analog. And when there were positive interactions to encode, we would express in our bacteria the phage polymerase is sp6 or T7 that would then recognize the downstream promoter and activate transcription. And for negative interactions, we would use the transcriptional repressors like I or TEDAR. And our readout was on the green gene here, um, GFP. Using those components, indeed it was possible to put together those four networks with these topologies so that in an arabinose concentration gradients, they would form a stripe of green fluorescence. When we took those cells and plated them out on an agar plate quite densely, in the middle of the agar plate, we put a paper disc and on that paper disc, we dropped some arabinose. So the arabinose would naturally diffuse across the plate and form a gradient. We observed these rings of fluorescence. So we have then done quite a bit of more uh, characterization of those networks, both experimentally and computationally. This is rather old work, so I don't want to go more into details, but I wanted to kind of use this as motivation for our next step. 
Also, we use those networks um, to address evolutionary questions. So we have a paper where we study constraints in evolution, and we are currently writing something up where we are studying epistasis. But what we wanted to do next is kind of explore a bit the more complex networks. So for so far, we have looked at the simplest ones. Here again, um, a zoom in for some of those networks. The problem was with the setup that I um, that we started with, with using Lagai, Tetar, um, we were rather restricted in the kind of networks we could build, and it was really difficult to get a network like this. Expressing those protein-based transcription factors is metabolically costly for our E. coli cells, and then if we stress them too much, they wouldn't behave anymore predictably. Um, also, the sequences of the transcription factors are rather long, so having many of those um, requires using multiple plasmids, and again, that limited us in circuit size and complexity. So we were using for an alternative solution, and we found it in CRISPR interference. So I would like to point out that from now on, most of the experiment or the next few slides, the experimental work has been carried out by Javier Santos Moreno, who was a postdoc in my group, uh, and recently left us to do a second postdoc in the group of Mark Well in Barcelona. So we started using CRISPR interference or CRISPR I. In CRISPR I, we use a single guide RNA that can bind to a catalytically version of Cas9, DCAS9, and together um, we so the single guide RNA we direct it downstream of a promoter. And then the complex binds here and inhibits on roadblocks the progression of the RNA polymerase. So we have inhibition of transcription. For us as synthetic biologists, um, this has a number of advantages compared to using protein-based transcription factors. So while there is initially some cost in expressing this DCAS9 protein, um, expressing additional single guide RNA molecules is really not costly for the cells. So we have a lower burden. And they're also super short, so we can have many of them on a single plasmid. Um, it's highly programmable, very easy to design, and there is basically an unlimited ver number of orthogonal versions of single guide RNAs available. However, um, when we started the project, it wasn't sure whether we can use this to build the more complex networks we are interested in. Indeed, in literature, there were um, uh, potential limitations pointed out. One of them was the lack of corporativity. So while natural transcription factors are often corporative because they bind as multimers or have multiple binding sites, um, CRISPR is non-corporate. And this corporativity provides a non-linearity that is important for many circuits to work, such as dynamic and multistable circuits. Another potential drawback is the slow off dynamics. So once DCAS9 is bound, it actually stays on the DNA very long and usually only displayed when we have DNA replication. And so it wasn't sure um, whether those limitations would prevent CRISPR-I to be widely used in synthetic circuits. If you look at the timeline of, of um, synthetic biology, so it, we, the field was really kind of kick-started in the year 2000, where there was um, where the famous publications of a network that is called the toggle switch, that is a bistable network, and the network that is called the repressilator, is a network that can produce oscillations in time. Then we had in 2013, we had the invention of CRISPR-I, and it had been used to build synthetic circuits, but only <clears throat> Um, for kind of endpoint circuits or kind of like logic gates, but nothing dynamic or multi-state. I guess I wouldn't be talking about to you about this today if it hadn't worked. But we think some of the design features we decided early on in the project were important to get reliable results. So I would like to talk you through those now. So we had our um, networks usually on a single plasmid. And we monitored all three nodes with fluorescent reporters, whereas previously we had only one fluorescent reporter. Now, we, um, by using CRISPR-I, we were able to use three of them. 
And that's very useful for model fitting and also fine tuning and debunking the network. The individual nodes were isolated by terminators and spacers. And also we have we have um, our constructs as operon. So we have a promoter here. And then when we have transcription, we have, for example, a single guide RNA on the same mRNA as our GFP, but we put here a recognition site for an enzyme that is called CSY4, which is an RNA cutting enzyme. So after transcription, we will have um, a cut, cutting here. And so then the single guide RNA can go and bind TCAS9 and the GFP can be translated. And so this avoids context dependent effects. Also, we have the gradation tags on our fluorescent reported so that we can also observe dynamic events. And again, we realize that if we put the same um, degradation tag on all the proteins, we have context dependent, we can have context effects because they basically then compete for the degradation. So we added different degradation tags or focal bonds. And in addition, we have a plasmid that codes for our DCAS9 protein and our CSY4 enzyme. And we also came up with a fast and modular cloning strategy so that we can very quickly build many of our circuits. Right, so then we were ready to start testing our CRISPR circuits. And so we started with a very simple setup where we used Arabinos to induce the expression of a single guide RNA that would then um, inhibit transcription of a downstream promoter. So we took a set of published single guide RNAs and indeed observed about four, um, 20 fold repression. And we can manipulate the strength of the repression by truncating the guide RNA by four nucleotides so we get the weaker repression. Importantly, the effect was dose dependent. So the more Arabinos we add, um, the less GFP we observe, meaning we have more single guide RNA we produce and we observe more repression. So this was good. So then we were ready to start um, testing one of our stripe forming circuits and we were focusing on this so-called I2 topology. So how this is supposed to form a stripe? Well, if our input is still the Arabinos, then with increasing Arabinos, we expect an increase of this orange um, node in expression. The blue node is usually on unless it gets repressed by the orange one, so we expect a decrease. And the green node is repressed both by orange and blue, so we only expect a high expression of the green node at intermediate concentrations where both blue and orange are not too high, and that's how we get this stripe. So we use CRISPR-I to put a topology together with this logic. And indeed, after some initial fine tuning, we got the network that would behave as we had predicted. And we got a nice um, stripe. And if we plate those cells now on an agar plate, we still have a ring here, but we also see the other two colors. This is very nice. And now we reduced the burden so we can go more complex. So one thing, for example, with did, we did is we added two of those um, stripe forming networks into the same cells. They are orthogonal and we have now one reporter each. And now our cells form um, a green stripe as well as a blue stripe at the same time. And since then, we also built um, many of the networks that we were interested in. This is just an overview of of some of the networks we have built, we went up to six interactions between the three nodes and, and we can now study their properties. But I wouldn't like to go um, into more details for this. I would like to show you what else we have done with the CRISPR-I circuits. So we've built this I2 topology. So then um, we realized that this is very similar to the famous repressor topology, which is a network that can produce temporal oscillations. Indeed, it's just um, the orientation of one of the interactions that's different. So my postdoc Javier put together also a network with this repressilated topology. 
And as you can see here, when we transformed our cells with this plasmid and watched the cells in a microfluidic device, um, we can see nice oscillations. And we call this network um, the CRISPR later. And so if we um, take snapshots of this movie that I should show you and, and arrange them in the timeline, we get this chymograph. And we also <coughs> characterized or quantified the fluorescence of this um, small chambers in the microfluidic device and, and we can clearly see oscillations. So the movie was obviously sped up a lot. Um, we have, um, so the period is about 10 to 12 hours and we have done oscillations for up to three days. What's quite nice also is that apparently um, the cells synchronize uh, oscillate in synchrony, even though we don't have any cell-cell communication. So it seems to oscillations are rather robust, so that in a microfluidic device, where most of the cells are basically related to each other because they inherited the same oscillations, um, they, they oscillate in synchrony. I'd also like to point out that we were the first ones to build crispr eye oscillator, but shortly after us, there were actually two other groups who used crispr eye to build um, synthetic oscillators, the repressilator, with the repressilator topology. One nice thing with crispr eye is that it's actually very easy to interface with the host genome. So we have our um, oscillator on a plasmid, and if we would like to control a gene in the genome, we don't have to do any cloning in the genome itself, which would have, which would be the case for um, protein-based transcription factors. We would have to add a binding site. Here we can just add a single guide RNA that targets a gene of the genome. And we have done this as a proof of principle with the gene rot set, which is a transmembrane protein. Um, and so a deletion of rot set leads actually to a change in cell shape from a more um, long shape or rod to, to a round shape. And so we've built this um, oscillator targeting rod set. And as you hopefully can see here, that when the cells are red, they are more long, whereas where they're kind of green, blue, they are more round. You can see this also again in the snapshots. We go from more long cells to round cells to long cells, etc. Another nice feature of CRISPR I is that it should be rather universal. So we have high hopes that it's not only working in E. coli, but also in other bacterial species. And we actually, um, in collaboration with our neighbors at UNIL, with uh, Anne Stephanie Rueff and Jan Willem Benning. Um, we transferred the CRISPR later into Streptococcus pneumonia, which is an opportuni opportunistic human pathogen. And there we wired it to control the capsule formation, um, which is the sugary coat around the bacteria. And this is an uh, important or the major virulence factor in pneumococcus. And so you can see here um, a movie of those oscillations. And so when they are red, usually um, there is only one lane of cells in the small microfluidic device indirectly indicating that we actually have the capsule, whereas when they are blue, two of the cells fit in here because they actually don't have the capsule. So we have oscillations in capsule formation. And so cells carrying this oscillator are currently used in a mouse model to get better biological insights into the importance of heterogeneity in capsule formation. All right, so um, we've built um, I2 topology with CRISPR-I, we've built um, synthetic oscillators. So then we were curious if we can also get multi-stable networks. So we wanted to build also the other famous network of synthetic biology, which is the genetic toggle switch. So then, a toggle switch is a network composed of two transcription factors mutually repressing each other, and they're leading to 
this leads to um, bi-stability. So we have two mutually exclusive states, um, stable expression of one of the nodes. So this is comparable to a light switch. Um, you turn the light on, it stays on, and you can actually remove your thumb and it still stays on, um, and then you can press again and turn it off. And so the original implementation uh, was a protein-based implementation where we have again the transcription factors log i and that r repressing each other. And so for the switching on and off, we can use small chemicals, namely IPTG and ATC. So IPTG binds to log i and then um, inhibits its binding to DNA and ATC does the same for that r. So we wanted to do the same with CRISPR i. Unfortunately, controlling um, single guide RNAs with small molecules is still kind of challenging. So we slightly changed the setup to this setup where we have an additional single guide RNA controlling this node and we induce the expression of it with a small molecule. So <clears throat> then um, when we add arabinose, our cells are in the non-green state because we basically repress this node. But then importantly, when we wash away the arabinose, they stay in the non-green cell, just like when you um, turned off the light, it stays off when you remove your thumb. And then we can switch it into the other state by adding AHL and then the cells go to the, to the green state. And then again, when we wash away the AHL, um, they stay there. You can also do it the other way around. And we start with AHL, they're in the green state, they stay. And then we can add Arabi Arabinos to switch them off and they stay there. Importantly, this is really due to the topology of the toggle switch, because when we test controls that lack one of the interactions, the cells would switch to their preferred state as soon as we wash the small molecule away. So that was a bit of a paradox situation. Usually we synthetic biologists are in the lab and think, well, it really should work, and it doesn't. Um, here, we were in the lab and all those nice networks actually functioned, um, but literature had suggested this might not work. So we were wondering what's the source of nonlinearity that enables us to get um, bistable networks and oscillations, even though we shouldn't have corporativity. Well, while corporativity is sufficient to get um, bistability, it's actually not the only possible uh, mechanism. So we were going through the other possible mechanisms, and one of them that took our attention is this um, depletion of repressor with decoy binding sites. And why was that interesting? Well, if you look at the DCAS9 mechanism, basically DCAS9 slides along the DNA, and then um, when it finds a so-called palm site, which stands for protospacer adjacent motif, which is um, for the version we are using is just NGG, it, quickly stores and evaluates if the DNA sequence is complementary to its single guide RNA sequence. If it is, it found its targets and stays bound there. If not, it will continue scanning. And so we were wondering if the scanning and binding to the palm site could be serve as decoy binding site and introduce the nonlinearity. So we teamed up with um, Yves Tassiudi, who is a PhD student in the group of Jörg Stelling, teamed up with the two of them, and they used methods from chemical reaction network theory, and they put together a model where they model not only the specific binding to its um, design binding site, but also unspecific binding, which could be the binding to palm sites. And they took, um, it took values from literature we found for this um, binding, how long that should take, and indeed it was possible to get um, a bistable behavior, suggesting that really the mechanism of DCAS9 scanning 
along the DNA might be sufficient or might be the reason um, why we can observe by stability in our networks. All right, as a take home message, as a first one, I, I hope I could show you that CRISPR is widely applicable to build synthetic circuits, and I've shown it for stripe forming circuits, um, for the oscillator, and also for the toggle switch. For the last remaining 10 minutes, I would like to focus on the toggle switch, but now also in more the patterning aspect. Indeed, I said we are interested in patterning, of course, I too can pattern, the oscillator is a temporal pattern. The toggle switch is maybe not obvious that it can also produce patterns, but it is. And it's actually a very common motive in many of the patterning, natural patterning networks. For example, in the neural tube gene network of the mouse or the gap gene network of Drosophila. And so while um, synthetic toggle switches had been built and studied quite extensively, um, we wanted to know how it behaves if we control one of the nodes with an inducible molecule like a morphogen that is present in a concentration gradient. And so just as a reminder again, um, the toggle switch is a bistable network and another important property is the hysteresis, which is um, it kind of be behaves different whether, whether depending on its previous state. So if you're looking here at the expression of the red node, we might need a certain amount of signal to switch to red. But if we come actually from here, we need another amount to switch back. All right. So we've done this work in parallel with the CRISPR-I study. So that's why we're actually here working with a protein-based um, version, where as I already explained previously, we have LAC-I and TETAR in each inhibiting each other, and we have fluorescent reporters M-Cherry and GFP, and we also have our um, morphogen analog, which is in this case AHL, which controls the expression of this red node, and we are controlling the strength of this interaction with the small molecule APTG. So we start all our experiments either in the red state or in the green state by incubating them either in the presence of those small molecules or in the absence. And we've done patterning assays on, on plates where we take a membrane and we put that on an agar plate and then we spread our cells on it. On, at the edge, we pipette our small molecules so they can diffuse across the plate and form gradients. And in addition, we also have done single cell quantitative analysis by flow cytometry, so that you see plots like this, where we, each point represents a cell, a cell, and we plot green versus red um, fluorescence. And we have also done mathematical modeling. All right, so I start with the spatial patterning. So this is one of those grids. So our cells grow on this. The grid um, is not necessary, but it's just kind of nice to visualize a bit better. Um, and so we have an AHL gradient here. That's our uh, morphogen, and we control the strength of this interaction with IPTG. So if we start in green. Our cells stay green unless at high AHL and IPTG, then they switch to the red. And if we start with the red cells, um, they stay red unless um, you have low IP, no AHL concentration, then they switch back to green. So if you overlay those two um, grids, we can highlight the region of hysteresis where the expression depends on the previous state. We get very similar results if we do the flow cytometry analysis. So here each um, square is cells grown at different conditions indicated with the IPTG concentration or the AHL concentration. And so if the background is green, it means most of the cells are in the green gate. And if it's red, most of the cells are in the red gate and white that we have in both. And again, we can overlay this and, and see, highlight the region of hysteresis. So then we teamed up with Ruben Perez Carrasco at Imperial College in London and took all this flow cytometry data, <coughs> made a mathematical model 
to characterize the underlying bifurc bifurcation diagram. So this is um, the fits to our data. And so this allowed us to, to build a bifurcation diagram, unveiling the different dynamical regimes that we can find with the, can achieve with this circuit. So if you have patterning here in IHL gradient, and we vary here the strength of this interaction with IPTG, we see that at high IPTG concentrations, we actually not bistable. It's just because we have so much IPTG, this repression is almost not here. So we have a smooth transition from red to green and vice versa. If we lower our IPTG concentration, we get to a bistable regime um, where we have some hysteresis, but we can still switch from green to red and from red to green. Um, we go even lower with IPTG or remove it completely. We get to a regime um, that's basically irreversible, meaning if we start with green cells, we cannot reach the red state. And so the tuning of this interaction allows us to reach those different states and they have different properties. So one of them is the hysteresis and the boundary position I already kind of explained. So here we don't have any hysteresis, whereas if we decrease IPTG, we have increasing hysteresis and shift the boundary position to <clears throat> higher IHL concentrations. And we also see that on the quantification from the flow cytometry data, where we get to this down to this irreversible um, regime, when we are starting in green, we cannot get red anymore. Related to that um, is also the boundary precision. Actually, in the regime where we don't have bistability, it's the sigmoidal regime, our boundary is um, not very sharp, so we get from red cells to, well, hopefully you can see it, dark cells to green cells. Whereas in the bistable regime, the boundary is much sharper. Again, this is the quantification of the flow cytometry data where you see at intermediate IPG concentration, we have the sharpest switch from red to green. And interestingly also is that in the sigmoidal regime, our population moves as a whole through a non-fluorescent state, whereas in this bimo by stable regime, we have bimodality where the cells um, are either green or, or red, but not non-fluorescent. And finally, um, IPTG also controls the transition timing. So patterning is much faster in this regime than when it's here in the bistable regime. Uh, my mathematical colleagues tell me that this phenomenon is called the critical slowing down because it's close to the saddle node um, bifurcation. And so we can also combine these different um, regimes and exploit the different properties. So imagine we have um, cells that, that are here, and they're green, so an AHL gradient wouldn't form a, a pattern, but we can give them a pulse of IPTG, we bring them up here, and then um, we can form a pattern of, of red and green cells quite quickly. Once, once the boundary is located at the desired position, we can remove again the IPTG and the system goes back to this irre irreversible um, situation. And now it's robust to any changes in the AHL gradient. And so that's what we have done. Um, so we given the cells first an IPTG pulse for different amounts of time. And so you can see here cells that are in between, and they're neither only green or only red, but then if you remove the IPTG, they fall in either into the green or the red state, and, and we can keep the boundary now, and this is now robust to changes. This we can also this memory function we can also show on, on the plate where we have a pattern here and then we transfer those cells onto a new plate where we now removed all positional information. We have no IPG, IPTG anymore and we have AHL present everywhere to the same amount. And we can 
maintain the pattern. And as a control, we removed all the AHL and they would all go to green. All right, so as a take home message for the second part, I hope I could show you how the toggle switch allows us to control the boundary position, the precision and the timing. And there seems to be a trade off between um, a fast patterning and smooth, but uh, less, less precise and in the bistable regime where we have a slow patterning, but a very sharp transition. And so we think that by using this synthetic setup, we can uh, um, <clears throat> study those effects much better than um, in a natural system and now have some ideas also how dynamic, how important it is um, to look at dynamical properties of, of this patterning circuit. With that, I would like to acknowledge um, my group. It's really um, a great team to work with, very talented people. Um, also, uh, my collaborators, those highlighted here that of work I showed today, of course, funding and you for attention, and I'm happy to take questions. So there's a question from a remote attendee. So he said, it's Camilo Andino. He said, thanks for the nice talk. Just to clarify, in your grid essay, the cells at the different grid positions are not in contact with each other and do not exchange signals, right? Um, yes, um, so they're, they're growing everywhere on this grid, but we don't have any active cell-cell communication because um, in this project, they cannot produce AHL by themselves. So we provide the external positional information. We actually, since then, we have also worked a bit on, on a system, a reaction diffusion system where the cells can produce AHL, but um, that, that's a different story. In this, in this case, um, there is no cell-cell signaling. Uh, I think we don't have uh, more questions. Ah, see. yes, we have one. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, just a quick question on the uh, the sort of repressilator. Um, you talked a lot about about uh, oscillation speed. How the how quickly do, does it actually oscillate, and can that be tuned? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, you have a period of about ten to twelve hours, which is a bit longer than the protein-based one, um, and we don't quite know yet what determines that in our case. Um, but one important thing of what the, how we could be tuned is actually the growth rate, because with division you have dilution of your factors, and so um, previous work by people working on the protein-based repressilator showed that, for example, by changing the media and then having slower or faster growth rate, you affect the, you affect the period. But it's not so trivial to change the period just with the circuit design. One more. I also have a question related to this. At some point, you showed uh, cells that were uh, oscillating uh, in synchrony, uh, but you said that that shows the robustness of the cycle because they don't talk to one another. But somehow, this also um, requires that the uh, you know the t equals zero uh, is the same for all cells. And I was wondering how this happens. How how come they are all entering the cycle at the mm -hmm. same time? Good question. Yeah. So. Um, one way would be that you actually, you know, you stop it and then release them together at the same time. That's actually um, work, previous work has, been, has this done for the protein-based um, repressilator where you, for example, add IPTG, you block um, where like I would bind and then you release them. In our case, um, at least in this version that I show you here, we cannot do this. But we think we observe still this in the small microfluidic devices because we, when we start the experiment, we see the device with very few cells. And, and so <clears throat> probably one cell then takes over and then all 
all the chamber is actually related to each other, starting from the same single cell. And then so that's why we see it more or less in synchrony. But um, we are currently doing further characterization really at the single cell level so that we can um, quantify the robustness of, of the network. OK, I think we don't have any more questions in the amphitheater. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you very much. All right. All right.